this book is due out when? Uh, due out next summer, but it's due in <laughs> no, <laughs> summer. In, July, in July 15th. Yeah, so. Uh, Are you ever tempted to... this stage of the election process to uh, identify some of your characters as a politician? Oh, they're all there. Yeah, <laughs> they just won't find themselves. That's the, the, the trick is to hide their identities. We move through Election Day morning here with uh, the current Secretary of State in West Virginia, Mac Warner, candidate for governor as well. Mac, good morning, sir. How are you? It is a good morning. I'm doing great. Mac, how much rum cake is at the party tonight? Well, <laughs> We'll we'll be ready. I'm sorry that I'm not out there in person with you. It's probably, uh, <laughs> yeah, take it easy on that stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, Mac, we are too. It's you and your rum cake are always welcome. <laughs> well, I look forward to getting back out there. This has become quite a Pavlovian relationship over the years with you, Mac. <laughs> Every time I see you now, my mouth waters and my stomach growls. Tell your wife, uh, thank my you. Wife sleep. Yeah. yeah, my wife would be proud to hear that. Let's uh, let's talk about the numbers first, Mac. Uh, your your current job, of course, as Secretary of State, and you are in charge of the elections in the state of West Virginia. I know you take that job very seriously, and there's some data out that we uh, related earlier in regards to the numbers and how this election shapes up. Uh, will we have a lighter turnout than we had in uh, in 2016, Mac? Does it look that way? It may. We were concerned there initially. Uh, the first seven or eight days of early voting uh, were lower than uh, anticipated, but then those last couple of days we picked right back up. So I think we're back to pretty much the historical numbers that we've had. Of course, 2020 was an aberration of sure. COVID, but uh, looking at the 2016, we're marrying that pretty closely. I see in the stats that Mike Queen, who does such a great job, sent me 1,643 voting precincts open today in 55 counties. There used to be 1,690 in 2022. Any particular reason for a drop of 47 precincts? Uh, just the clerks, uh, a number of things. Of course, the census has come out, the uh, single-member districts, a number of things. And I think the clerks are just trying to uh, be as efficient as possible, but yet uh, maintain the opportunity for people to vote. So we haven't heard any complaints about the uh, fewer precincts and uh, – of course, they've got to get the, the poll workers who just get five poll workers for each one of those precincts. So where they can consolidate, uh, bring them together, uh, they will. There's also the ADA accessibility, making sure that the people have access to the polling location. So that may come into play as well for uh, they can consolidate precinct because one is easier to get to the other. So, uh, but there's there's been no issue or complaint about that any point in the state. Not more. And uh, any words you need to share with our listeners out there who will be voting today, Mac, in regards to voting on this Election Day 2024? Well, of course, just encouraging people to vote. The more people that vote, uh, the more confidence we have in those that we elect. But this is American. And it's a, you have your free choice whether you vote or not. Uh, here in the capital city, there's a fair amount of rain. That may dampen some people's uh, opportunities to vote and willingness to get out. But uh, I'm hoping that'll drive later in the day. Uh, I, I always like to tell people, especially in my office, that it's our job to run a free, fair, clean election. It's the candidates and the parties and, and uh, you know, the campaign's job to get people out to vote, to motivate people, motivate people to vote. Uh, there was some discussion early on that uh, since the presidential candidates seem to have already been determined, that may uh, lessen some of the turnout. Uh, but I really haven't, haven't seen that. Uh, once this picked up at the end of the early voting, uh, to get the numbers back up to where the traditions were, I think that uh, we're just on par with uh, there's just not as much enthusiasm in the primary as there is in the general election. And I asked you this four years ago when you were running for re-election as Secretary of State against Natalie Tennant. In regards to running for election, being in charge of the election, and also being a candidate in the election, how do you separate the powers in that situation so that there's no suspicion of anything that would be uh, anything other than above board? Sure. Uh, my focus today is, of course, running a uh, free, fair, clean election, working with the uh, the clerks to make sure if there are any glitches anywhere that we address it. We have about 16 investigators slash uh, people that uh, work in our office out across the state. Each one of those has three or four counties that they're uh, checking on. So we do have roving uh not patrols, but uh, there uh, people going from county to county to you know, be there in person if there's a glitch. 
uh, they can address it immediately. And uh, so my focus is, is running the election. Campaign, uh, of course, does go until 730, but uh, I've taken the campaign signs off my truck and those sorts of things. And uh, I'm focusing on running the election today. Bill Stumblefield. Uh, good morning, Mac. Uh, I think if the election was based strictly on being a nice guy, you'd win hands down because you are a nice guy. Uh, I get the sense that you've changed your message about halfway through. Uh, more recently, it's been your accomplishments. Uh, am I correct in, in a, a, a market shift in direction of your campaign? Well, I've, I've stayed away from the, the mud slinging or the, the negative campaigning because I want to focus on the positive. Of, we need we got we have some big challenges in the state, especially with regards to education. Uh, and I wanted to focus on getting that message across that if we can change education, if we can improve education in West Virginia, that improves so many other areas uh, of our the, the economy, the family life, the opioid crisis, obesity, all those things stem from if you have a solid education, that is the one thing that somebody can't take from you. They can repossess a car or buy your job or whatever, but they can't take your education. And I think that's our job as the government is to ensure that every child in West Virginia has a quality, quality education. And uh, that, that's been the focus. So uh, it's more of a doubling down, I guess, to try to get out that positive message uh, to people and uh, to stay away from the, the negativity that uh, we've seen going on in some of the other countries. Uh, Mac, this is John Gilstrap. Good morning. I know you carved out time. your niche that you carved out very early in the campaign was as the education candidate. And education has kind of reared its head here in Berkeley County just recently with as kind of a crisis situation. One of the schools here, it's sort of out of control, has been taken over, not taken over by the state, but it's certainly under scrutiny. <clears throat> and what's coming clear is it seems that there's a systemic issue where um, the the local school board isn't being communicated to by the superintendent. And then we have the state school board and there's there's this bureaucracy that makes it very difficult for anybody to solve the problems of discipline and fixing test scores and that sort of thing as governor and as the education governor how how do you fix the abysmal test scores i mean it's a it's a constitutional issue it's an organizational issue how, what is the actual plan to fix this systemic issue that is plaguing our education system John, wonderful question. I'm so glad that you asked that because uh, there are layers of complexity in this. And, of course, I, I didn't want to bring it up, but you've already done so. The, the middle school there uh, it, it has been identified and how it's broadcast statewide about the, it, its problems. But I've heard that and seen that in a number of the schools. I've probably been in 40 school, high schools and middle schools uh, just over the last four or five months. And you, you can walk in, and I'll tell you what. It begins with the bathroom test. If you walk into a bathroom that is clean and you're not afraid to go in there, uh, that speaks volumes about the school, the administration, the education. If you walk in and there's problems in the bathroom, things are uh, rusted and uh, broken down and so forth, that tells me right there we've got a problem in that school. So I would just start with, with that. The Board of Education, the principals, the leadership, needs to walk through the bathrooms of each of the schools, and it will tell you right there whether uh, kids are probably getting a, a good education or not. So the, the key, though, is with the teachers, teachers in the classrooms, certified, qualified teachers in those classrooms who are being paid, uh, commensurate with the, what they're, they're, they're teaching and their duties, and that they're allowed to teach. And what you just mentioned is it's a discipline problem, and I've seen it in a number of schools. The Eastern Panhandle is the only place where that's happening around the state. And so we have to address that administratively, whether it's through legislation and empowering uh, the teachers to do what needs to be done, the administration. And sometimes, and I think you all have a pilot program out there where we were actually removing some students from the school and putting them into a specific uh, uh, situation where there are trained counselors to deal with disciplinary problems. And what's causing that? Probably problems at home, lack of uh, a two-parent uh, system, family, traditional family values, drugs, it could be any number of things, but something is causing that uh, aberration in the student. But what I've heard from teachers is sometimes this can be identified in the first, second, third grade, and we shouldn't just pass that along until it gets to middle school and high school and get the fights and so forth that are being talked about now 
we need to get that counseling done at the earliest ages to solve those problems. So those are just a few of the ideas, a few of those layers that I have uh, in my mind as to how we tackle it. And uh, I'm anxious to get into a position where we can do something about it. My military background and my legal background has trained me that when there's an issue, go to the site, go to the crime scene, reconnoiter the the attack or the the defensive position and so forth. You have to be on location. So school boards and so forth, others should not be surprised that something has arisen. If if they haven't gone there, yeah, they're going to be surprised. If they've gone to the school, uh, this crime scene or the the site of the, the problem, the fights and so forth, will speak to you and tell you what needs to be done to clean it up. Mac, do you have uh, internal polls that give you optimism for tonight? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's been one of the frustrations. Many of the uh, statewide media haven't been interested in the polls that uh, we've done. But the only poll that counts is the one that's going on right now. And, uh, so, yes, very much so. Uh, I think people are going to be surprised at the outcome of the uh, election. And the good thing is we're going to have results tonight. Uh, that's one of the things we've done in the Secretary of State's job. We've got all 55 counties to use the most, uh, the best election equipment in the United States where you have tabulation that will occur tonight so we have results, but you'll also have those paper ballots so we can audit those and make sure that the paper ballots match the tabulated ballots. Uh, that won't occur until six days from now. Next Monday is when the canvassing occurs. That's when results will be final. But I think we're going to know tonight pretty much every race uh, the outcome uh, due to this electronic or the, uh, the tabulation system that we have in place. Mac Warner, our guest here on the program, as we're talking with all of the four major Republican candidates for governor uh, this morning. Mac, of course, the current Secretary of State. Mac, uh, many of the candidates, uh, including you, I'm sure, would like to get rid of the state income tax in its entirety. Uh, some are calling for that to happen sooner than later. There is a triggering mechanism that's already been put in place by uh, the current House of Delegates in the Senate and, of course, the governor, which automatically, if left alone, would, over time, with the success of the state's economy, eventually diminish the tax on a gradual enough basis that it would go away. Would you like to accelerate that process as governor or leave what's in place in place? Well, what we'd like to do and what's realistic are two different things. I'd like to do, yes, I'd like to get rid of it as soon as possible. But realistically, you have to do this in a phased manner, and I think the triggered mechanism that the legislature has put in place is the adult way to go about doing it. Uh, otherwise, you have to start slashing programs, cutting programs to make ends meet. And uh, you want to do it on a phase basis where you cut some taxes, see if that actually helps grow the economy. If it grows the economy, then you get more taxes in based on the growth of the economy. Then you cut some more. So I think the current system the legislature has in place is realistic and uh, is the adult way to go about doing it. I was going to say Bill, but I think Bill went right before me. So, John, you're up again. <laughs> we heard on the show, I don't know, it's probably two months ago or so, one of the counties here, and I, don't, I, won't, I won't guess because I, I don't really remember, but 44% of the, the minors, the, the children in this county are in foster care, 44%, uh, which is obviously a, a huge number. And it's indicative of a foster care issue throughout the state, which is indicative of other problems, too. As governor, that's a big problem you've, you've got to tackle. What do you see as the primary source of this issue, and what is the, what's the solution? The, the source that I hear throughout the state is the opioid or the drug addiction crisis. And so uh, there's no quick fix to that. We have to get at that problem. In a whole host of ways we can address that if you want to. But the foster care, what that causes is uh, children without the, the natural parents, uh, and then they become basically wards of the state, and we have five foster homes and so on. So uh, we, we need to attack that uh, the source, the, the problem, the drug addiction, and some of the other issues that, uh, that arise from uh, that, that cause these uh, children without parents. But uh, we have to address things like the, the grandparents that are taking care of these kids. We have to get them uh, adequate pay. Sometimes they aren't getting the compensation that somebody else who would uh, take on the foster care uh, child. Uh, so, so we have to equalize that so things are fair across the board. But one, one of the cases 
that I'm aware of, that we have to be careful because foster children are not being used as a way to get money from the state where people take eight, nine, ten foster children. Sometimes that's wonderful if somebody could do that, but in another situation, you find out that they're being used as a means to, to an income producing thing for the family. And that's not the right thing. We want somebody who's actually caring for those children and not using it as a money making proposition. So there is a balancing uh, approach that has to occur all the while tackling the, the problem at the source. And for the most part around the state, it's the drug problem. Bill? Mac, let's uh, move forward to the general election. Uh, you received a lot of uh, applause throughout the country for what West Virginia has done to ensure fair, uh, fair elections. Have you seen other states take corrective action to avoid some of the problems we had in uh, uh, 2020? Yes and no. Yes, I have seen some states uh, taking corrective action, and they've sought our guidance, what we have done, how we did it, how we cleaned up the voter rolls, how we've ensured uh, results on election night, how we provided that uh, confidence in the election that has happened here in West Virginia. It's, it's noteworthy. It really has been some national attention. Um, but then I've also seen some states that have pushed back against that. We, we saw in Wisconsin, they first decided to get rid of drop boxes that caused so many problems in the 2020 election. Then there was a change on the Supreme Court, and they decided back the other way that they can go forward with the drop boxes. But if you don't provide security measures, say cameras and lighting and rules as to how many ballots you can drop off, then we can see the same thing happening in the 2024 election that happened in 2020. They haven't cleaned up some of the problems out in Maricopa County, Arizona. We still have some issues down in Georgia. So uh, in Pennsylvania, who knows, because that uh, had problems in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, two big uh, urban centers in the rest of the state abided by the rules that were in place where the city didn't. Not only that that has been addressed adequately either. So uh, all I can say is we're responsible for West Virginia. We're very sure about the security and integrity of our election process. All I can do is hope that these other states uh, have enough uh, election integrity network uh, to to watch the polls in Philadelphia and uh, and up in Detroit, Michigan, and some of these places where there were real problems uh, in 2020. Uh, so I'm hopeful, but I'm not real confident that uh, enough has been done. Mac, so there are some folks who have not yet voted in uh, our listening and viewing area. Here's your chance to convince them to vote for you for governor one last time. The mic is yours, sir. Well, thank you so much. It's the experience that I bring to the office. This is on-the-job training for me. I've been at this for a, a lifetime of public service. This would be the pinnacle of my career. Uh, I'm not running for this office, but run for U.S. Senate or some other office. I want to be governor of the state of West Virginia because I love West Virginia. I was born and raised here. Uh, just rich memories from my, my childhood. And of all the places in the world I could live, I have chosen to come back here to West Virginia and bring that lifetime of experience with me. I've got a wonderful wife, Debbie, who the two of us will live in the governor's mansion and uh, just serve the people of West Virginia. I'm looking forward to this opportunity. Uh, to take this lifetime of experience and put it to work for the people of West Virginia. You know, the Bible tells us to whom much has been given, much is expected. We have been given much, and I, I hope that people expect a whole lot out of me as a governor. I do ask for uh, people's vote, and uh, today is the day. Get out and vote. Appreciate you giving me this opportunity to talk to you. Appreciate you calling in, Mac, and uh, all of your accessibility over the years while you've been Secretary of State. Best of luck to you today, sir. Thank you so much. Great being with you all. Secretary of State Mac Warner on the program here as we roll through Election Day morning.